So what do statistics and ethics have in common? On the face of it, not very much. But I'm going to tell you a story of a gentleman I met recently, Bob. Hopefully, by the end of it, you'll understand what statistics and ethics have to do with Bob. And maybe you'll appreciate how hard it is to make the right decision, and to even work out what the right decision is. First, you need to know a bit about Bob. He was 90 years old and lived at home with his wife, Mabel, with whom he had three children and a handful of grandchildren. He retired a good many years ago from a job in engineering and had enjoyed his retirement to the full, into his mid-80s, but in the last few years had started to do less. Prior to me seeing him, he could only walk a hundred yards because of pain in his hip, had had a heart attack a few years ago, suffered from mild cardiac failure following this. He, however, didn't consider himself ill. He may have only got out of the house once a week and had difficulty bending down to tend to his garden, but he could still complete the crossword in the broadsheet and certainly didn't need carers or anything like that. Now, let's look at some statistics. Firstly, let's look at the probability of Bob living one year. Now this is a very interesting area. Somebody decided recently that GPs had to have a list of all patients they wouldn't be surprised if they died in the next year. That's it. That's the only question. I think it's a fantastic question. No clarifying, no complicated statistics for someone to input wrongly. Just one simple question. So would we be surprised if Bob died in the next year? Yes, I think we would be. He's got no progressive or acute conditions. He still walks independently. So let us put that into a graph. Exact numbers aren't important here. So the y-axis simply runs from zero to lots. And on the x-axis we have time through our story, which doesn't really need any units and certainly isn't linear. So here's Bob, maybe not quite at the lots end of the spectrum, but a very good way up. Now if we were to look at the same Bob and plot the same graph, but ask about five or ten years, the answer would be a lot lower. Certainly not zero, but a lot lower. After all, he is 90. Some 90-year-olds go on to be 100, but not many regardless of health. But what happens if we change the question to the probability of Bob living one week? Pretty good. And now for the ethical bit. What's Bob's expected quality of life over the next year? Now quality of life depends on lots of personal things. But at the moment, although maybe not perfect, Bob's pretty happy. His quality of life is pretty good, and we have every expectation for it to remain that way. So here are our three graphs. One week survival, one year survival, and quality of life over the next year. Bob, unfortunately, was unlucky. He met me. Now it's not specifically that he met me that makes him unlucky, but that I work in a hospital. And for him to meet me meant that he had to be admitted to hospital. And we know that you don't want to be admitted to hospital. Look what just happened to Bob's graphs. Now before anyone starts interpreting this as never be admitted to hospital, this isn't what this is showing. A doctor somewhere thought Bob would be better off in a hospital, that whatever is wrong with him, it can't be managed as well in the community. Now I don't want to make this into a community v hospital thing, so please don't take it that way. I just wanted to highlight that old people that are ill enough to end up in hospital do badly. But you know what? If he gets out of hospital, his quality of life has every chance of staying pretty good. So why was Bob in hospital? He'd fallen. The hows and whys aren't important for the sake of this lecture. But what is important is that because he'd bro fallen, he'd broken his hip. He'd fractured his neck of femur. This is bad news. This is always bad news. This is one of the most dangerous diagnoses to come into hospital with. There's the operation, the anaesthetic agent, the infection risk, the rehabilitation, the general stress on one's body. Look what's just happened to our charts. And this is where our first dilemma is. Operate or don't operate. Thankfully, this question was answered for us years ago. If you don't operate, you do awfully. You certainly don't walk again, you develop infections because you can't walk, you may well die. A few years after we realised this, we went further. Operate quickly, or spend days trying to operate, optimise the patient medically before operating. 
Turns out, taking time to optimise is bad. If they'll survive the anaesthetic, it's probably best to operate now. It's a bit more complicated than that, and that's partly why orthogeriatrics exists as a specialty. But as a simple rule, that'll do. So the plan was made. Operate ASAP. Unfortunately, events happened. Operating lists were full. Anaesthetists were concerned about wanting exact cardiac function prior to an operation. The junior doctor was off sick and the hospital ran out of beds. Or maybe the patient arrived at 10 minutes past the wrong hour. I don't even know what's true on that list. But something happened and the operation was put back a day. In that time, Bob developed pneumonia. Now Bob was always going to develop pneumonia. If he'd been operated on within hours of admission, he'd have developed pneumonia. But it would only have shown up after the operation, and by then his hip would have been fixed. He didn't develop pneumonia just because he wasn't operated on immediately. But now, as a consequence of having pneumonia, he had a spiking temperature and significant hypoxia. Septicemia during an orthopaedic operation is awful. Metal work gets infected, and that's bad news. Hypoxia, especially hypoxia when lying down, is really bad for anaesthetic risk. Now our risk-benefit equation has shifted. Now the risk of the operation and anaesthetic is higher than waiting a few days and operating them. So that's what we did. But what's developing pneumonia and delaying the operation done to his graphs? Yep, down, down, down. You know what happened next? Just as he was getting better, he had a heart attack and developed pulmonary edema. Was he unlucky? Maybe. But was anyone surprised? No. Now clever people in clever laboratories will tell you fancy things and talk about cytokine cascades, stress responses, and interleukin-6, and fancy words like that. Now I don't know anything about that, but what I do know is there's a statistically significant increase in heart attacks around big football games. Watching football stressful. And you know what? So's breaking your hip, so's severe pneumonia. These patients often have heart attacks at the same time. Now let's look at his graphs. They're awful. What's the chance of him surviving the next week? Low. What's the chance of him surviving the next year? Very low. What's his quality of life going to be like if he survives? Probably pretty low. Let's look at a good case scenario. He's now almost a week into a hospital admission where he's not moved from bed. He has severe pneumonia, he's just had a major heart attack, he has fluid on his lungs from the cardiac dysfunction and he still hasn't had his operation and won't be fit enough to for at least a few weeks. On top of this, he's 90, only able to walk 100 yards and gets out the house once a week. How deconditioned is he going to be from a few weeks in bed? So a good case scenario now as in with significant care needs and awful mobility a few months down the line. And that's if he doesn't develop any further operative or post-operative complications. Our good case scenario is pretty bad. So what's his potential quality of life? Now, this clearly depends on lots of things and what's important to Bob. But regardless, it's getting much worse. Up to now, the decisions we've had to make have been pretty forced. There's been a clearly better course of action at each step. Things are now far more complicated. Should we keep treating Bob? Bob isn't actively dying. He theoretically has reversible problems. But he has an awful prognosis, and even a good scenario is pretty awful from a quality of life perspective. We have lots of decisions coming up. Treatment for his heart attack. Should this be with medicines or with procedures? Should we be artificially feeding him as he's not really eating? Should we treat any present or future infections? Should we lie him flat, which will increase his breathing distress, to scan his head just to make sure we aren't missing anything? To what extent should we provide symptom relief? I think stopping all active treatment at this point is a very hard decision to make. But you th If you think about what treatment now is probably doing, changing one mode of dying to another, Extending someone's life with very little quality, possibly even distress, just for them to die a few days, a few weeks, maybe a few months down the line. Maybe, if we're lucky, keeping someone alive for them to very much not be the same person they were before this admission. Suddenly, the decision's different. Primum non nocere. First, do no harm.
How should we look after Bob now? What should and shouldn't we do? What treatment's too far, too aggressive, too distressing? It's all shades of grey. People seem hardwired to value life at all costs, to chase the improbable without regard for the consequences. But is that humane now? I don't think there's any definite answer to these questions. So what happened to Bob? I don't think knowing helps. You have to make a decision at the time with the information available at the time, not by looking back at what happened in one particular case. All I'll say is Bob wasn't a statistical outlier.